Go. I'll tell you my first concrete memory of you. And we were at the improv. It was probably 16 years ago. You were like, Sarah, guess what I did? I got my hole waxed. It hurt so much. And I was like, oh, my God. You were so That's excited it. to tell me. It. And I was like, it made me, it like moved me that you were excited to That's tell it. me. That was it. <laughs> How, what is this? Is this your fifth special? My fourth. Really? Yeah, I don't do it. I never think about a special until somebody's like, we want you to do a special for us. And I'm like, oh, okay. So you, uh, you literally just, do you just go, okay, and then I'll be ready in like a month? No. So I did owe a special to HBO yeah. and then the pandemic happened. And then I didn't do stand up for a real, the longest I'd ever not done stand up since I was 18. Yeah. And then we came out of it. I started doing stand up again. And then I got a call like, we we want our special <laughs> and I like I did everything I had one night that I still liked that was still you know and I had 37 minutes and I was like all right I gotta shoot this in like three months <laughs> you really? know? so I went on the road I'm sure a lot of comics you probably do that you know you probably go on the road to figure out what you have and like write a whole special but I usually like have it and then I go on the road so oh, yeah. writing on the road was I knew it was possible because I think that's what a lot of comics do. I just not had not done that. Dude, wait, wait you, you've never been like a serious road dog, though. No. I remember one time. Did you do a, like a Guinness tour one time? I don't. Maybe. The, the, isn't it crazy? The things that you remember as a young comic where you go, that would be so cool. And then it's things that you're like, I guess I did. I don't know. Right. Yeah. No, I did tours and I'm, I mean, not like you, but like I did a bus tour a few years, you know, a bunch of years ago and, or I did, um, this last one was like three months. Really? Yeah. And where do you find yourself? What cities do you, do, do you do much of the middle of the country? Yeah. Really? I mean, I, I feel like half the dates I did their abortion was illegal. If that's anything. I got a great abortion joke that, uh, is murdering in the South. Oh, what is it? What's oh, a, is that the joke? Yeah, no. <laughs> <clears throat> it is. They do consider it murdering. No, it's my daughter, out. Isla. I talk about Isla a lot, and she asked me to write a joke for her. Like, I want you to tell a what joke What is she, 17? 16 now, yeah. Ugh. And she said, I want you to write a joke about men shouldn't legislate, legislate what women do with their bodies. Mentions what? Shouldn't legislate what women do with their bodies. And I was like, baby, that's not my strong suit. Like, I'm not good at that. That's not. And she goes, if, you, if you're if you a good comedian, you can do it. Do it. Oh. And so I wrote it. And I, and I, and it, I'm like, I'm like, I'm not sure anyone's going to like it, but it's doing really well. I, I played, I told it in front of Leanne the other day in, in Austin. And she was like, she was like, I, that's a fucking. Are you going to do it for me? No, 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 no. I guess no. that's weird to do stand up yeah. at someone. I was okay. I was, there was like three bits. I was like, I wonder if she'd do the bit for me. It's uh, it's funny because I met you se probably 17, I, almost 20 years ago. I'll tell you my first concrete memory of you. And I knew, I know I must have known you before this because it was like familiar, but we were at the improv. It was probably 16 years ago. And you were like, it, you're like, Sarah, guess what I did? I got my asshole waxed. It hurts so much. And I was like, oh, my God. You were so That's excited it. to tell me. It. And I was like, it made me, it like moved me that you were excited to That's tell it. me. That was it. Really? <laughs> I was like, That's amazing. That must have been crazy. <laughs> I've been, I've been, I think about that time at the improv so much because things have changed so drastically from senses of humor. Like, and I and someone asked me, Rolling Stone magazine asked me, they go, What do, what what happens when someone laughs at your joke the for the wrong reason? And oh I, yeah. And I go, I don't know. I don't really have an answer for that. <laughs> like I've never like like because I've had it happen where you make a joke, a racial joke or something. Right. Not I don't do it as much now, but when I was younger, I definitely did. Right. <laughs> and they were, and and they laughed for the wrong reason. And I was like, I don't know. But that was there was like an an accepted sense of irony back then that i think is gone yeah does that hope, make sense i hope not forever yeah like where you go well there's a context and people go there is no context that makes that okay and i'm like but in art doesn't their context does and then the context changes and that's what makes it art is you you look at it in its original form and then you look at it again as the world is changing as your life is changing and what you see is different like yeah. it may make it wildly problematic but it's also what makes it art you know yeah.
I remember, uh, like, I can I can highlight them. Todd Glass asking uh, people to stop saying the the f word. Uh huh. I remember. Wow. I, what's what's really ironic about that? Or I don't know if I, that's the right. Wait, is like two weeks before. No one will ever find this good clip. Rogan said, "I'm going to stop saying that word." Oh. And I went on his podcast, on like a death squad podcast. I said, "Really?" And he goes, "Yeah, I'm. Gonna, I'm I think it's lazy, and it's and I'm going to stop saying that word." And I was like, "Oh, cool." And so in my head, I was like, "I'm going to stop saying that word," but I didn't mean it. I just was like, I, "You know, I don't even know if I said it that much at the time." So I was, I was a grown up, and and then I heard Todd. I remember listening. This is back when podcasting was like brand new, and I was listening on a computer, and I was sitting at a desk listening to this podcast I did with Marin. Oh yeah, when he came out. When he came out, and it was so. It's like you need moments like that. I wonder if we get that because we have such a diverse group of friends and other people don't sometimes. You know, like my, my buddies that I grew up with still talk like that. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm from New Hampshire. I'm, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, it took a long time for me. And, you know, and with Todd, it's really interesting because. People really didn't know he was gay unless he told them. Like he yeah. t- had told me a few years earlier, but um, you know, I had tried to fix him up with women early on, and you know, I had no idea because he doesn't. He's not effeminate at all, and he never talked about it. And he because he was not out. He was yeah. out with his family, like in Philly. Really? Yeah, but he didn't want to be a, a gay comedian. He wanted to be a comedian. Yeah. You know what I mean? And like he was worried about that. And he had so many friends, close friends that he was privy to them making gay jokes and all that stuff that, you know, we would do not consciously just it was like that v- last vestige of like. You don't realize it's like having a mic on you, when you have a mic on when you're doing something and someone's like, yo, you're mic'd. And you're like, huh? And then you don't realize what you've been saying. <laughs> That's what it's like to have a, a, a friend that's been in the closet. And then you're like, well, I haven't been that bad, right? And then all of a sudden you're like, well, I might have said really horrible stuff to him. Yeah, because like we say horrible stuff to each other as yeah. comics, yeah. you know. But um, and he was worried about Spade because like Spade was like his best friend, you know, and everything. And and this is his story to tell, but I'm going to tell it because it's so great. But like when he finally came out and then he talked to Spade and he was like nervous to talk to Spade and Spade's like, dude, I knew. And he's like, how did you know? And he goes, I don't know. Like when you were talking about chafing dishes for an hour. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's great. But he is so funny. And like with I'm again, I'm from New England. So I grew up going like, that's so gay. And, you know, I mean, like I said, my special, we played smear the queer like it, it, it never occurred to me what what that those words oh yeah you know what i mean but like i remember defending saying gay like i say gay like i have gay friends like i just mean it like st- like it's stupid it's you know whatever and then all yeah. of a sudden i saw myself as the guy going like what i say colored i have colored <laughs> friends yeah, you know yeah. like <laughs> and that was like the moment for me where i was like <clears throat> your comic change with the times like Good it's, grief. It's, it's funny because like I feel like I, I feel like and you don't have to you don't have to agree or not agree. I feel like mm. you got the most shit out of people when you decided to like change your go like I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna listen and, and like all of a sudden it was like I felt like Seinfeld was like, I don't even do colleges and you were the one person who was like, No, I'm gonna change and I'm gonna grow and, and I feel like you got yeah. the most shit. I'm not gonna do anything I disagree with, but like once you hear that something like cuts a whole people. Yeah. <laughs> like, how do you unring that bell? Like, no, you you don't have to do anything. Like, I hate this culture where people are made to apologize. It doesn't mean anything. No. It means nothing. What means something is if you're sorry and you apologize. And that's the only time you should apologize. Oh, oh, I had a I had a dream last night. Oh fuck. Oh fuck. I had the best dream last night. Take your time. God damn it. Take the limitless bullets oh, uh, in there. Uh, never mind. Never mind. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Uh. After. It's, a, it's a real. It's, it, it wasn't a dream. It was a real thing. Um, my, what changed for me was um, not, with with just like being like this is so stupid. But Isla, my youngest, mm-hmm. um, wanted to be an actor. Wanted to be an actress. Whatever baggage I had from never being cast in anything and only succeeding in comedy and podcasting and 
I just kind of shit on acting. I shit mm -hmm. on actors. I shit on acting. And I, and I realized I'm doing that to my child who wants to be that thing. Yeah. And I realized I was like, that's fucking like, I literally in the middle of doing it was like, hold on. What, what, what am I saying? Like, and cause I'm looking at her face and she's like, really? They're not like, I know, but it seems like it would be fun. And like she you can see her defending it. And I'm like, Oh fuck me. And then I had to back up and be like, I'm baby. I'm, I don't know why I'm saying this. I go, this is probably shit. I should talk about in therapy. I was not good at auditioning and I was not good at acting and I get uncomfortable acting and I'm not good at being anything other than me. And I, and that's, I'm not even great at that. And then I, and then I, and then the next day I'm, I was teaching Georgia how to drive and I, I made a comment about the person I, I was, I size up the person's car and go to, take a watch out for that car. They've got tape on their review on their side mirror. That means this person doesn't give a fuck about their car. And I started doing it and I started going like, hold on. Am I, am I putting out these fucked up opinions I was raised with to my children? Like God, and then I, I was like, God forbid I say something homophobic to one of my child, children who's dealing with their sexuality. And then I, I was like, okay, fuck, I'm not, I'm, I need I need, and then legit spent two months in therapy, just talking about like trying to fix me and the thing that I, the things that I say, because you know, so many of my friends do that. And I grew up in Florida, but like, you know, support whatever the fuck that I don't even know what's going on really to, to be dead honest with you in Florida. But like there, I watched them post on their Instagram and I'm like, what if their kid is dealing with some fucking thing, you know? I, first, that's so beautiful, Bert. Oh, no. well. it, 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 it's like it's just that you look <coughs> inward at all, reflect. People go their whole lives without doing that. And it well, makes it their lives and their the lives that they touch shittier. Well, I think I think that, you know, just watching her wa see you process that is better than if you handled it perfectly. Uh, I think. Maybe I mean, well, like, she's wow. only got one type of dad, and it's a fucked up one. Like I'm, I am. Uh, luckily, my, my wife's a little fucked up too, so I can always like, like, like I, it's it's nice to team up. Do you ever do you ever regret not having children? I don't regret it, but I get sad about it a little bit. I love kids. Yeah. You know, I love kids. And uh, actually, my my boyfriend did your podcast, uh, Rory Albanese. Yeah, I know Rory, yeah. Yeah. I was just talking about he him the other day. He loves you. I was you. talking about him the other day at uh, at uh, at uh, Good Morning America. Oh, yeah, yeah you worked there. Yeah, he used to work there. <laughs> and so, yeah, you, you've always had, you've always, I, I've, I've, every dude you've ever dated, I've always been like, fucking love that guy. I do have good taste in men, I you've think. You've got great taste in yeah. men. Yeah. There's one that I never met. That I would have liked to have met. He was Catholic. He was Catholic. Oh, there are a few Catholics. There was a, it was a long. He was overweight and he was Catholic. Oh, Tom Giannis. Yeah, I just saw him. Yeah, I don't. I never met him. I never knew who he was. But I remember meeting him. I remember meeting him at the improv. This is back. This is a while ago. And going like, oh, there's got to be something really cool about this guy. Yeah, like rides a Harley. Yeah. but he's like really soft spoken. But he's he's super funny and yeah. Yeah, he's a good one. But you, but some people like, I, I think sometimes like, once you run through the whole thing of life, you go, oh, I, I would have been a much better divorced dad. Because <laughs> you see your friends who are divorced dads, and they just show up on weekends. You're like, oh, I could have killed that. Oh uh, yeah. But then I then technically I, did because that's what I did doing in the road. Oh my god, I watched you and Christy. Was it Christy Stefano? Christy says, yeah, talk about being dads. Oh my god. You were both crying. Oh. It was so beautiful. And it I get I mean, I don't get it because but you know, I was on the road for three months and it's so long and you just have these tent poles, like these carrots where you're like, I'll be home on this date, you know, and oh I can't wait. I'm gonna do fucking nothing, you know, but it's different for you because you're like, I'll be home. And then, you know, I remember actually Todd Glass saying when he was in a relationship, he would come home from the road and be so tired and so happy to be home. And his partner would be like, well, while you were out having a good time, you know, and it's like, it's fun. And the whole idea is to project fun, but it is not, it, listen, it, you're right. It's not digging holes, you know, but yeah. it's, it's, it is work, you oh, know, yeah, and it's, it's fucking sitting at Southwest gates all day and like cars and, tra you know, 
not complaining, but you're o- t- taken away from any kind of normalcy. You know? it's, it's if you can. Uh, it sucked when they were young, like when they were young. That's when it really sucked, and you'd get. And, but I would just numb myself by drinking, and I'd just be like, I'm, "I'll get through this. This will be fine." That's why I take my shirt off. In, in all honesty, Thursday night. I remember the first time I ever really did it was at the Dayton Funny Bone, uh, and I, I was Thursday night, and I and I was like, I was like, this fucking sucks. There's, I, I remember. The room was not full, it was, and I was like, and no one looked like they wanted to see me. And I was like, this fucking sucks. And Doc was like, can I get you a beer? I was like, get me six. And I was like, one show. I was like, I'm just going to drink six beers and have a good time. And then I was like, wait, this should be a good time. And then I was like, this should be funny and silly and fucking fun. And just because I don't, I miss my family doesn't mean that they have to witness me missing my family. And so I just got on stage and spontaneously ripped my shirt off, and they start went crazy, and I went, oh, okay. And then I killed a beer and Doc was in the back. And I was we were playing Ram Jam. And I and I and I was and I had a, a six pack of beer and I went, one more. And he goes, one more. And so I killed another beer. And then I go, one more. And he goes, one more. And it was so silly and fun. And then I was like, ah, oh. and then I just started doing it to cheer myself up. Like, like uh we all I know that your thing for a weird period, I don't know if you do it anymore, but you're you had like you had like a celebratory bong hit after a show. Yeah, or I mean, uh, I don't travel with a bong, but uh, it'd be smelly. But yeah, joint. I love, yeah, having a puff after a show. How did you? How did you manage marijuana? I know I I read a book one time. You were talking about you had anxiety on on you had anxiety and depression when you were doing SNL, and yeah. you were taking Xanax. How did you manage? Clonopin actually Klonopin, that time Klonopin. that helped me. <clears throat> how did you manage? getting through that I, i'm always curious to know if i a have depression because i don't think i have it but i don't know you're not on anything no i'm no no i but i do have like a i have a, a come down period like if i'm not if like uh i just had a really busy you know m- three months and i didn't drink the other day and i definitely felt this like anxiousness i had an anxiety attack at dinner last night with my wife and uh, and I and I was like, how do you how do you qualify it? And what I'd love to hear your story of it because I I know that a lot of people listen to me know I've talked very openly about it about having anxiety and having a little bit of OCD, but I never really know if I have depression or if they're connected. Right, and I know you're probably aware like everyone's on it so willy nilly like oh I'm having a feeling you know like yeah. so you're probably very like don't want to like I know I never want to like I never want to uh uh trivialize depression and to, to someone that really has it and then go, Oh, I got that. And then, then, and then, and then go, but you seem like you're having a good time. And I go, I get, maybe I don't have it that bad. You know what I mean? Right. But it sounds like alcohol is fun, but it's also medication for you. You're self-medicating. Oh, hard core. I mean, the way hard, you're talking core, about it. Hard, yeah. Core, hard core. <laughs> right. So, um, maybe that works for you. You know, but like, um, that's the, I would love if you were my therapist. It's, I had a therapist one time. I told her I had a fear of flying, and she goes, "Well, when was the last time you flew?" And I was like, "Tuesday." Yeah, and she right. was like, "Well, then you don't have a fear." I was like, "Hold on, what?" She goes, "You got through it." Like people that have fear of flying don't fly. Right, right. Like didn't like Aretha Franklin never fly? She just took buses. John Madden, <laughs> the thing. John Madden just oh really? Buses. Yeah, I loved that during the pandemic when the bus would pick you up in L.A just drive you cross country and then you'd work your way back to LA. I love that you worked during the pandemic. Like it just didn't even occur to me. I was just like, well, everything has to, you know, But that's the, that's my anxiety brain. Like I can't sit still. Right. If you were to need to sit still, would you be able to handle that? I can't do it. Now I can, I can, and I, I don't, but I can sometimes, hear the silence and be cool with it sometimes not all the times like this morning i couldn't this morning i was sitting at the thing and i was angry that no one wanted me to work out this morning and i was angry that i didn't work out and so i was like i was like i'm gonna work out before i gotta go over to beverly hills to do uh a guy's podcast i go i'm gonna work out in between podcasts i'm gonna do that and i was like but i couldn't enjoy the silence i'm not i can't i have a really hard time when i see people pat oswald said you know my favorite part about about the pandemic is just sitting on my front porch and reading a book and i it was almost like he was trying to deny the holocaust to me i was like <laughs> i was like 
I don't. That's impossible. Well, the book was Mein Kampf. <laughs> I love that little chunk, by the way. <laughs> oh, yeah. I love that little chunk. I'm going. I and we're going to definitely talk about Hitler in a second. But um, <laughs> but like, so what? What was your experience with anxiety? When did it show up? Why did it show up? When, why did you? Because I know everything's a trauma marker. That's what they would say. But like, I, I'm, I'm, I would, I would do ayahuasca if it told me my trauma markers. I would do it in a heartbeat. I would love to find out what happened to me to give me this because I, do, I don't like having anxiety. Have you done ayahuasca? No. no I know. I really want to do it, but I'm s- a little bit scared. I'm yeah. fucking terrified. Well, I, I wonder if it was ayahuasca that my friend Mia was telling me about years ago. We went out to eat and she goes, there's this drug. And a bunch of my friends took it. And if you take it, you can remember every moment of every day of your life. But the only down part downside is you have to wear a diaper because you 100% shit yourself. I shit myself so much. Yeah, like if that I won't it, even notice it. And you don't remember every day of your life. And I t- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What was what do you think like like was that ayahuasca she was talking about? It had to be. It had to be. It had to be. Yeah, I um When did anxiety my- when did anxiety show up for you? Well, when I was 13, I got off a bus at a, of a camping trip that I cried the whole time like a fucking, you know, baby in my mind. You know, I was I, I was embarrassed. I had like diapers hidden in my sleeping bag because I was a bedwetter. That's right. You know, I'm like 13. Yeah. I was like small for my age, but like girls had boobs and stuff. And I had like pampers in my sleeping bag. And I just was humiliated and I just wanted to like get off the bus and and get in my mom's car. I just was talking about this and um my mom picked me up, which never happened. And uh she had a camera because she was a photographer and she just was like click, 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 click. And all I wanted to do was get in the car. I was so embarrassed. And I was trying to like covertly tell her to like, Mom, stop that, stop, please, like begging her, but she wouldn't. And it was like depression just that I had never experienced just came over me in that moment and lasted three years. But it's interesting Whoa. now looking back on it that it's like that w- way of being ignored while you're having all the attention, like mm-hmm. she's ignoring me, but she's like taking my picture is so like was so foreshadowing for like you know, paparazzi or TMZ who don't bother me at all. I couldn't care less. It's not like I remember I was meeting a friend who was famous for lunch and he's like, well, do, will paparazzi be there? I go, I don't, do you read star weekly? Like, what do you give yeah. a fuck? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> but it is like an interesting one time I picked her up at the airport and, um, in LA, my mom and, uh, TMZ, like someone famous must've been there. And then they were, saw me, you know, like, yeah. uh, you know, you get like those like sloppy <laughs> seconds, you know, and, and they're following us to the car and I'm being, you know, like, oh, you know, nice or whatever. But then my mom is standing by the car, still talking to them. I go, mom, get in the car, you know, and we're driving away. And she's like, I don't know why you're so rude to them. It's That's their job. And I'm like, yeah, but like if we got in a car accident and died right now, that would be the best thing that could possibly happen to them. You know, <laughs> like is that they would have the last picture of us. So it's, it isn't totally sunny, you know, but anyway, so in eighth grade, that's when that happened. It's a whole story. I'll Did you give you think- the- did you think, do you think that, did you get embarrassed by your parents? I, my mom, I feel so guilty saying this, you know, yeah. but, but she, yeah, she would, oh, mom, you know, oh and, and I've completely become her. By my, the mom, way. my mom would do this by, <laughs> that was almost today, your joke. When you were, I was one of my favorite jokes. So like the first time I ever saw you perform, you were in sweatpants and like an NYU sweatshirt mm-hmm. and you're, you're still very attractive. I go, who is this chick? I'm from. Florida State, right? I think I'm. I might be your age. I think. I think we, about, I'm 52. You're my wife's age. I'm 50, and so I remember like we. I came from done up girls, and I see a girl in sweatpants <laughs> and a sweatshirt, and 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 attractive, and I'm like, who the fuck is this? And they're like Sarah Silverman, and they go, I go, what the fuck is like? She's doing laundry, and they're like, no, she's a comic, and I went, huh? Like I thought you'd yeah, like, like look like, what you're wearing. Yeah, I I, I was like, I, and then and you were like, you ever been looking I, the other day i was looking jelly off my boyfriend's cock and i realized oh, i'm so turning into my mom oh, yeah. and i fucking i was like holy shit like all of a sudden the idea of a of a woman was rearranged for me and i was like 
oh my God, I never hung out with girls with personalities. I hung out with just girls I that I was like, oh, that's who you're standing next to. And I was like, right. I was like, fuck. And then I saw Janine and I was like, fuck. Like, oh my God, where where were these girls in college? And then I'm like, not in the sororities that I was hanging out with. <laughs> but uh, my, this is my impression of my mom. Oh, this when you say that, this is my impression of my mom. I was obsessed with figuring horses as a kid, like the plastic ones that you put on your shelves. I was obsessed with them. And I remember there was one of this, I was obsessed with the movie, The Black Stallion. Of course. And it was the coolest movie that's ever been made. And there's a, oh, there was this Black Stallion that was up and it was at a toy store in, uh, in um, the mall, uh, whatever the mall is on Fletcher. And w- we went back to get it. And I went and I went and looked at the thing and I didn't see it in the case anymore. And I was like, I don't think it's here. And, th- and my mom goes up to the guy and she goes, hey, we're looking for a black figuring horse. And he's like, yeah, it's gone. And she goes, well, Bert, what do you want to do? And I'm like, fucking six. And I'm like, no, I don't, I'm not in charge of this conversation. Um. I was like, can you please? And my mom's like, well, no, he, I mean, he wants it. Do you know where it is? He, are you sure this is the right place? And it was like that negotiation, that her being the middleman of that and me talking to adult, I remember being like, I remember just fucking crawling into my skin. I And I was oblivious to what a fucking weird kid I was. I wore Speedos in public until I was like seven or eight. And I just, I just. That was just your outfit. Speedos and knee-high moccasins. And I wore them way too late. Like I wore them way too late for like someone should have said something to me. And it just was my dad, same mall. And he was like, we were like, we're going to the mall. And I was like, cool. I got in the car in a Speedo and knee-high moccasins, and he's like, do you want to put something else on? And I go, no, cool. And he's like, I... All right, because you're in Florida. It was like yeah. 90 degrees. I was like, yeah, let's go. And then he was like, you think you're going to stand out? And I was like, I don't think so. I was like, I wear this everywhere, Dad. I'm fine. And he was like, uh, you're going to look like a fool. And I was like, I'm good, Dad. And then when we got there, I started realizing it was like it was like my baptism into society where I went, I'm the only dude with knee-high moccasins and a speedo. Like, start, and then I would like pull my dad aside. This is really <laughs> specific to anyone who grew up in Tampa. There were these dinosaurs and turtles, and and it was right by Oshman's. And I was like, "Hey, can we?" And he goes, "Get something to wear." And I was like, "Yeah, can we get something to wear?" And he went and bought me a tracksuit in Oshman's. And I was like, "And I have tactile issues. I don't know. I'm a fucking nightmare." But my my point is not to bring you here to tell me tell you about my trauma. I uh, I really identified when I found Xanax of like, of I remember giving it to my dad for the first time. And my dad goes, is this what regular people feel like? Right. It's the greatest. Well, I, in eighth grade, I was put on ultimately 16 Xanax a day. And I was like a tiny 13 year old. Holy. Four Michael Xanax Jack- four times a day. Michael Jackson was prescribed 250 milligrams of Xanax. A day. It's, it's crazy. That's so, that doesn't. I was just like a little zombie kid. It was crazy. so irresponsible. Well, I went. Yeah. Anyway, it's all I've told. But um, but at SNL, I got SNL. I was twenty two. It was nineteen ninety three, and like almost immediately. How do you ha- how do you handle that at twenty two? I didn't because all of a sudden, with like in a second that feeling came over me again that I recognized from being 13, 14, 15. And I was like, oh, no, no, no. And I was like, in my mind, I wanted to quit and move home to New Hampshire. And um, it sounds so appetizing at times, doesn't it? Yeah. And then Mark Cohen, you know, Mark Cohen? Very well. I know Mark Cohen. I know Mark Cohen. He found me like a midnight therapist, like who who put me on clonopin, which just like blocks anxiety for the short term until I was able to like see a therapist and get put. So I was eventually in, I've been on Zoloft since 94. And that was what happened to me. Like your dad, where I was like, Oh, I just feel normal. Like, I feel like I can completely be myself. I still have highs and lows. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But not, paralyzingly so yeah i can think my way through them but only because i have this reinforcement of serotonin in my brain that you ever have stomach problems yeah you know i learned that because you know how it's all about serotonin that's like is the coping this juice that 
makes you able to cope yeah. is also the stuff that gets reallocated to your stomach to mend your stomach, which is why there's such a connection with stomach issues and depression. Because the serotonin you need in your brain has been sent to your stomach to repair it. The so I have a thing that goes. I I, I don't know. It happened. Were you were you with us at the table last night when I go? Why is this happening? Leanne says to me, um, uh, "I'm going to Tampa Sunday night." She goes, "Why are you going to Tampa Sunday night?" And I, it's happening. It, it just happened again. I have a, t- a fear of flying, and it, all of a sudden, I realize I'm flying on the red eye to Tampa Sunday night, and my stomach turns. Or, and or no, I'm sorry. I'm going to New York. I'm going to New York to do to start fully loaded. And my stomach turns, and I go oof. And it is a physical fucking reaction. It's it real. is a full blown physical reaction, and no one can uh, acknowledge it because they don't feel it. And when you don't have it, it just seems like someone's talking about ghosts. And you're like, and I go, my st- my stomach's turning. And then last night at dinner, we started talking about. I don't know, whatever, it was something, and I started getting it again, and I go, and like, and just randomly, my chair was up against the, uh, up against the railing, and the table was on my stomach, and I couldn't move, and my jacket felt tight, and I'm like, hey, I need a little space, I'm like, she goes, why don't you go take a walk, and I was like, no, I'm gonna, I'd be like, I'm gonna like lose my shit, and I, and I was like, it's happening, it's my stomach, I, I, I it, it, it is a physical reaction, my butt cheek sweat, and my stomach turns, and I'm like, I can't control this. Well, I mean, it's funny, like when people go like, oh, mind body connection. But it's like if there there's that's if there's no mind body connection, how do you explain nervous diarrhea? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's completely could all, all that shit's connected. When I remember I remember doing stand up for a little while and then finding out uh, I got to I got to give her props. Segura's wife, Christina Pajitsky, said to me, hey, do you shit before you go on stage? I go every time right before I go on stage. She goes. Me too. And I was like, wait, you, and I was almost like when you heard about jacking off in high school and you're like, someone was like, you do the thing that everyone says they don't do. And you're like, wait, you do it too? That means I'm not gay. Oh my God. I'm so fucking dang. Thank God. Do you have a tattoo? Do you say tattoo? I say tattoo. I know the proper pronunciation is tattoo. But I say tattoo, and if you do have a tattoo, you got to check out Mad Rabbit. Mad Rabbit is committed to reinventing tattoo aftercare. Founded by two friends with a passion for ink, Mad Rabbit creates simple, effective, and natural products that help improve the healing process and preserve tattoos, all delivered directly to your door. Their hero product, the Tattoo Balm, revitalizes, replenishes, and proactively preserves tattoo ink. It's effective on both new and old tattoos and skins of all type. And when Mad Rabbit says natural ingredients, they mean natural ingredients. The balm has eight ingredients, shea butter, cocoa butter, beeswax, calendula, that's a flower, sweet almond, lavender, frankincense, and cucumber. That's it. So forget the days of ingredients you can't pronounce like the way I can't pronounce tattoo because Mad Rabbit's not going to leave you high and dry. They will definitely not leave you dry. You know what your body is getting is all natural, truly. Plus, they've got pro- all the products you need for your tattoo, from a tattoo sunscreen to a tattoo so- soothing gel, all stuff for your tattoo. And in April 2021, just two years into Mad Rabbit's existence, they became a carbon neutral company because they believe in leaving the world a little better than when they started. I'm telling you right now, I've got two people in my family, soon to be three, all with tattoos. I got it for Georgia as a way for, for me to say that I accept her getting ink when I didn't wasn't really consulted, and I know that I'm not supposed to be consulted because I'm just the father and it's her body. But whatever, I'm a little still a little frustrated. <laughs> but that's that was my that was my gift to say that we're good. So when you think tattoo care, think Mad Rabbit. They've preserved over 1.5 million tattoos, and right now they've got an exclusive offer. Just for us BurkCast listeners, if you go to madrabbit.com slash BurkCast and use the promo code BurkCast, you'll receive 25% off. That's 25% off when you head to madrabbit.com slash BurkCast and use the promo code BurkCast. Uh-oh, Father's Day is right around the corner and you haven't gotten your dad anything yet, huh? Don't worry. That's where our sponsors of the show today come in handy. Manscaped comes in handy. Both you and I, No, he needs some serious grooming in his life. So grab your dad the Performance Package 4.0, and he'll thank you for helping 
tame his beast. It's a win-win situation for both mom and dad. Go to manscaped.com and use the code BERT for 20% off plus free shipping. Manscaped is the only men's brand dedicated to blow-the-waist grooming and perfected their game with the Lawnmower 4.0. Imagine surprising your dad with a sleek, well-designed, and optimized grooming kit that says your balls will thank you on the box. Their fourth-generation trimmer features a cutting-edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to their advanced skin-safe technology. You might ask, how is this Lawnmower 4.0 different than their other trimmers? Well, this upgraded trimmer includes a multifunctional on and off switch that can gauge in a travel lock. Thank God so people don't think you have a vibrator in your bag when you're going through security. This is a great feature that if your father or yourself do a lot of traveling, you're going to thank. <laughs> it also gives you their ability to turn on the 4000K LED spotlight on and off when you need for a more precise shave. You can now shave your balls in the dark. And you're thinking, why would I do it in the dark? Just think about this. When you're doing it over a toilet, sometimes you don't have the best light. Well, all of a sudden you have light. The Lawnmower 4.0 even allows you to customize your trim through additional guard lengths with sizes one through four. Have you ever seen a nose hair sticking out of your dad's nose? Well, the Weed Whacker 2.0 nose and ear trimmer is the best nose and ear trimmer you're ever going to find on the market and is the perfect gift for your pops. They also have amazing products like the Cologne Crop Mop, Ball pres Wipe, Ball Reviver, Ball Toner, Crop Preserver, Ball Deodorant. Get your dad the gift that you know he will use. Get 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use the code BERT. Don't forget that you came from your dad's balls. This year, show your original home some love with Manscaped. But yeah, I fucking nervous, nervous diarrhea is like something... I, I, I almost, I know you talk about this in the special and, and by the way, the special is fantastic. Um, you're thank so, you. you're so good. You're just so good. You're just so good. Like I, I list, I was listening. I listened to it last night in bed with Leanne. And then, and then this morning I, I, I was like, I think I kind of skipped over the middle part. The middle part's my, I gotta be honest with you. It's my favorite. The, all the stuff about, uh, the toilet paper commercial. Oh, yeah. I got, can I tell you, like, I actually, I, and I, I didn't realize, like, how much of a comic I am now, but I go, why didn't she open with that? I would have opened with it. Really? I would have opened with it. I would have opened with it because you get such a, pat like, I like as a guy doing a shit joke, it's so stupid. But when a girl does it, it's so smart. It's like when Louis, do you remember when Louis would do, like, uh, eat a bag of dicks? And you're, and you're like, that's a dumb joke. But when Louis does it, it's funny. Well, right. He found, well, it's like, like Todd Glass. Like I had a joke literally from high school that I did like in the beginning of my career of just, and it was just like, my, uh, my friend asked me if his breath smelled like tacos. And I was like, I don't know. Do you put shit in your tacos? Like I wrote it in high school and Todd Glass years later was like, do you still do that joke? And I was like, what? No. How do you even remember that? And he goes, can I have it? And I said, yes. I was so excited. And of course, he made it into like this 10-minute genius, like super <laughs> yeah. meta thing. No, but it's interesting because you talking about all that stuff, I, I watch it and I go, it's so good. And it's so good coming from you. Because it's just, it's like, it's different. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I mean, I, it's weird because I'm just like... Do you ever have a thing where when people say your material back to you, you're like, ew, you know, but like, I <laughs> yeah. don't feel gross when I say it. Like, people always are so gross to me because they think like I'm going to love it. And I react like, oh, that's awesome. You yeah. know? But inside I'm like, oh, I'm a lady off stage. But um, yeah, I, it's. Uh, well, well, you know, what you do, you know, what you do well, not to like, but like you do this thing where you. Your throw, like even like even like the squirrel thing, where you go, uh, like th that's a little throwaway, and you you acknowledge it. You do it well in your special, like you do it so right. well in your special little throwaways. You make them so fun. You really have an ability to make a special feel like I'm watching you at Largo. Like you don't you don't make it feel too scripted it feels very loose so much so that i go how many shows did she shoot like as a comic i go how many shows did she shoot which one did she use is this the one where she took is this her second show of the night where like i i was like i was literally breaking it down in my head going like i'm dying i want to know all the ins and outs it's so interesting because i've only done four specials but i've 
tried to learn from each one. And like the last one I did. The, le- the lighting for Jesus is magic. Changed the game in specials. The lighting? Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow, that's Liam Lynch. He was- no, the, the lighting in Jesus is magic was the fucking best lighting. Specials were done a certain way up until that point. I'm, I'm, I'm a nerd about specials. I'm a nerd about specials. The lighting, uh, the backdrops and all the lighting was done in a very sterile way because uh, the whatever the place where, the, where they used to shoot the man show, that, that was the company that was doing all the specials, mm. uh, Burn Will Mill, Bryn, Bryn Mill. It was when, the, oh yeah oh, no Bur- um Murray Bur- Burnham Murray or something some, like that. no no that's that's they did they did <laughs> don't don't get me started on MTV road rules they the, but they did used to do um uh-huh. all the specials and it was very sterile and then you did that special and it felt special and it, it really was like the first one to feel special mm. you shot that in what two thousand four four th- five yeah, yeah. It came out and, in five and I remember going like whoa and then all of a sudden backdrop started changing wow yeah i i'm i'm really like i'm obsessed with well like this guy liam lynch he directed my all three of my first specials and but that first one jesus is magic we worked so we had so much fun working on and like and um like he spent 40 hours (laughs) taking there's one moment where i like flick a tear like wipe a tear and flick it and then he spent 40 hours on a tear flicking off my finger and then Steve Ag in the wings catching it and then jerking off with it. <laughs> and it was just a side thing, you know, yeah. it was just like a little, little detail, but I was, I was, I was so impressed. I had a great moment on Razzle Dazzle where I had, were two moments that were really hilarious in the room. One, I had to piss in the middle of the set. And so oh. I just went over to the side of the stage and pissed in a cup. And, uh, and I was like, I was like, and I was like, it's real. And I'd been doing it a lot. I still do it a lot on stage because I, I end up having to go to the bathroom in the middle of my, I, it's, it's anxiety. Really. It's not anxiety on stage, but it's anxiety about, I got to piss. Like, yeah. if, like I, that's like, I remember one time in the car with my dad driving from Key West to Florida. My I pissed so much that my dad forced me into the bathroom and he goes, I want to see it come out. <laughs> and, was, and he's like, you're making this up. I go, I'm not making this up, dad. And so, and then that, and then it, I had a, another part in the la- last bit I said, I said, I called my dad daddy and it creeped me out and the whole room out. And I was like, oh, and it was really fun. I put them in and they just didn't, it didn't, it looked scripted. Yeah. It's so weird. And you're like, it, this was the realest in the moment moment. Yeah. But if it doesn't look that way, then it wasn't. It's crazy. Cause it, it <clears throat> should feel but yeah, it doesn't. Isn't that funny? The only one I've ever seen that felt real was when Daniel Tosh kicked two dudes out of his special. It's one of the fucking realest moments. And then when Greg Giraldo had a dude fall asleep in the middle of his special. Where did he shoot it? Like t- like Reno? In, no, I think he shot it in Queens. And it was this Jamaican dude who passed out in the middle of his special. And it's fucking just so... It's just Greg stopping down and going... I, I mean, he, he's just falling, he's asleep. <laughs> it's such a great, uh, he was such a great dude. How many, I mean, not to like, not to bring death into this. How many friends have you lost? Because I've lost a lot of friends, but you've, you've, you've known, you've been in this, you went, when you started when you were 18, 17? I mean, the first time I did stand up, I was 17, but I didn't like pass at a club in New York until I was 19. I didn't start until I was 26. Wow, isn't that funny? It's just like there's no, and it's just like you were saying before, it, it is the most diverse, eclectic group of people because the only thing that ha- that we have in common is comedy. So it's like I have friends that are in their 80s. I have friends that are like 19. I have, you know, like every culture, every religion. It's like, it's pretty cool. Do you think, do you ever think of sliding, the sliding doors of like, who, what would you be? Had comedy not gotten you? Can I just say Sliding Doors is a is my most used reference for a movie I've never seen. Gwyneth Paltrow. I've never seen I've it. I've never seen it either. It was just on TV and I go, here's my chance to actually see the movie that I reference never, all the time. I've never and seen I it and I reference didn't. it all the time. Because I'm obsessed with I'm obsessed with little things that happen in your life that change it forever. Butterfly and, effect. 
that movie had a profound effect on me. I also I wa- didn't see that I one. Watched, I walked out of that movie <laughs> going, oh, this might be the best movie I've ever seen in my entire life. Uh, it was, oh, I want to see it. It's, it will. It it doesn't hold up. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, like I think about that constantly. Little things like Leanne's a big sliding door for me because I had a moment where when we started date, dating, she broke up with me and I fought to get her back. And in getting her back, there was a moment she, where she said, this is going to be serious. If it happens, I'm not fucking around. You need to have intention with this. And I had this moment where I was like, I could be, and for lack of better words, and I hope you get this reference, I could be Gary Valentine. Gary Valentine was the dude. I know who he one, is. Yeah, 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 yeah. He was, he, was, he was like, Bertsky, we go to the bar, we hang out, we meet new chicks. That's how it works. You, d- you don't, don't get locked down. You know, don't get locked down. Just me and you, end of the bar, every night we meet new chicks. And I go, I could be with Gary Valentine at the end of the bar every night, or I can walk away from that bar and go with Leanne. Had I not met, I always wonder, like, had I not met Leanne, I would never be where I am today. I would never have any success. Mm. And and I think the same thing about Last Comic Standing 2. Had I gotten picked on Last Comic Standing 2, I, it was devastating for me at the time to not get on that show. Devastating, but it would have, I would never have had a career. Because I would have been the guy with 15 minutes who could was a good feature act. And I would have never grown because I would have had to sell as a headliner. But but I wonder, because you've had, I mean, I just wonder, has stand-up not found you? Or you not found stand-up, rather? Do you ever think, who would I be? Like, like when you like are on a plane and you see like some lady walk by, you go, would that be me? Would I be some exec at, 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 like, at like Nike? Nah. Would I? I don't know. I feel like I, I don't know. I mean, I've. I planned on being a comedian since third grade, you For know. Real? Yeah, I know. Ne- I, I'm lucky in that way of because I saw other friends going, Who am I? What do, what do I want to be? What do I? And it's like, what you do isn't who you are unless you're a comic. I mean, like, and I just, have, uh, I've just always yeah. been a comic. Like, I, I've i never imagined anything else other than like, I wanted to be in musical theater. I wanted to be an actor. I went, but always, but. As soon as stand up took hold, it, that was all I really thought about. I mean, I do love other things and doing odd jobs, like you yeah. know what I mean. But um, maybe I'd be a teach like I'd like to be like uh, everyone's favorite, te- you know, like Mr. Cotter, you know, yeah. and maybe a teacher <laughs> or uh, work with um, maybe work with like um, mentally challenged adults or kids or people yeah or um i'd like to say that's what i do but i think i'd sell boats oh that sounds good too i think i'd be a salesman do you ever watch bloodline i love Bloodline. well just because you're talking about florida and then you're talking yeah. about boats I and love like bloodline. oh my god that show is so good and then the actress in that which oh linda carlini actress that, uh, the actors yeah. what no, do you she, mean the act oh the actress. Oh, I meant, oh, I meant no. her. I or meant Linda, do you mean... Um, I meant Linda Cardellini. Andrea Riseborough, too, no, is incredible. Linda in Cardellini. Yeah. I immediately was like, who is this? I have a crush on her. She is She has got. She is adorable. She's incredible. She is fucking incredible. And then I'm like, I love when you find someone like that, and then you go, wait, she's been, she was in Freaks and Geeks? Like, she was... Wait, she's been doing this for her... And then you start going back, and you're, like, untangling it, and you're like... Oh my god, I've seen it in a million things. Well, that's like Norbert Leo Butts, who plays the brother who's like the boat guy who has a coke problem, who's with, like whatever. And I go, that's just like a Florida guy they found. The, the guy, and he's got the Australian accent. You mean the guy that smokes cigarettes? Oh outside? no, that's the guy that that gets killed. The guy who, the brother who, yeah, yeah. The fucked up brother. Who's who's just and he's got that southern accent. And then you find out he's Australian. I know that and guy's like, incredible. And he ben, smokes in every Ben. Mendelssohn? Roethlisberger? Ben Mendelssohn. Yeah. Ben, <laughs> ben Mendelssohn. No, uh, but Norbert Leo Butts is the brother who... Yeah, that's Ben M- Mendelssohn. Yeah. yeah, I know. You can't believe it because he's like... But then there's the brother that's Norbert Leo Butts. Who, where is he on there? Where is he on there? He was the brother... Ben Mendelssohn smokes in everything he's in, by the way. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. He was so good. No, really. And I just go, that's just like a Florida dude. He had like the wraparound glasses. He worked on the boat. His wife was pregnant. He's the second row to the right. So then I look him up. Oh, yeah. 
and he's like a musical theater star. I was like, oh. huh? And then I worked with him once. He did a workshop of the musical I did, and he's like fucking incredible. You seem like you would be someone who would be really fun to deep dive a series with. Yeah, I, I love, I mean, when people go like, what do you love to do? And like, you are so active. You're always doing stuff. Like for yeah. me, my passion is TV. Like I love watching series. I love yeah. anything like murdery, thrillery. I've only had one series. This is a deep dive. Uh, I've only had one series that I like got into. And me and Leanne were like, we watched all of it with Nip Tuck. Oh yeah, remember I remember Nip, Nip Tuck? Of course. I got really into Nip Tuck for a, for like a weekend. Every time I'm in a hot tub, I think about that girl who had dire like who had like a I don't know if she had a like colostomy bag or something, but she's dating one of the doctors and then it like she diarrheas in the whole oh, hot tub. I don't remember really that episode. Disgusting. Yeah, I I like I, Game of Thrones. Sorry, I, was, Leanne, I really Leanne, thought you'd be like, yeah. I don't remember that episode. <laughs> you probably blocked it out. Um uh, Game of Thrones, the girls deep dove it when we were in Italy. They oh. were like, they were like, really got into it. So good. And I was like, oh no. And I, I, and then watching it the second time, I was like, oh, I didn't understand this series at all. Like, I'm really bad with names. Oh like, yeah. When they do Lord of the Rings, I'm like, name one guy Scott, like so I can follow the fucking story. <laughs> like everyone's Undlar and Landar, and I and know. I'm like, it just everything's like consonants and an A and a U. Like I need a, a Derek, a Scott, a Bill. And then, and then give me an Undlar. And so I, I have a hard time following those shows. I'm My not, uh, sister's married to an Indian man. And yeah. uh, like his, Indian man, like Indian like from man. India. Okay, yeah. yeah. And uh, he, um, I mean, he's here now, but he lived in India till he was like 29 or, or to college or something. Yeah. But he's a sports editor. But um, he, uh, his parents were coming over. And I had not like met them yet. And I was like, you know, and uh, I texted Laura, my sister, and I go, will you send me their names and like write it phonetically? Because I want to like really know it when they get here. And she goes, <laughs> Sarah and Tom. I was like, oh, <laughs> such an asshole. I slept on Indian chicks. That's like if I could go back, that's like there's a couple races I never got to. <sighs> Like, like I, and I'm really attracted to Indian chicks. Like, and I'm never, I never like, I just, I would, I would say that it was, uh, my surroundings wasn't Florida in the seventies. Wasn't very diverse. I knew like one Chinese person. I knew one, maybe two families that were Indian growing up. But then when I moved to New York, I was like, what the fuck? Yeah. I was like, when I moved to New York, I was like, this is different. Jewish chicks. That was my, because oh, yeah. I went to a predominantly Jewish grade school. Whoa, really? Yeah, but predominantly in Florida was like, like probably half. Oh, like that part of Florida. Yeah, yeah. No, no Tampa. Oh, really? Jews in Tampa? I was so jealous that I wasn't Jewish because all the Jewish kids knew each other. So like, like you'd come home on, you'd come to school on Thursday and they'd be like, oh, how much fun was David's bar mitzvah? And we were, they were, we were all in like fifth grade. And I was like, wait, you guys went to a bar mitzvah? And they're like, well, yeah, it's David Fabricant, the older brother. We all went to his. And I was like, wait, you guys all hung out this weekend? And they're like, oh, we like, we had a great time. We par we were dancing. They had a great DJ. He made 35 grand. And we're like, wait, what the fuck? Oh my God. Like, yeah. Me and, the, me and the five Christian kids, like Eric Knuppel, Brian Callahan, uh, Brian Crane, like the, just the, there were like five non-Jewish dudes that I hung out with and all they all like all the Jewish kids knew each other. And I was like, fuck, how do we get into this? I was you in that scenario because I'm from New Hampshire. I didn't know Jews like I didn't know. I never I didn't get bat mitzvah. I never been to a, I hadn't been to one. I, you know, I'm from fucking farm country. For real. Yeah. Shut up. No, I I. I envied, and then when I moved to LA, I even it came back again because every Jewish kid had great grade schools to go to, a great preschools and great schools to go to. In LA, in LA, wait, oh, you mean like chill your kids? Your kids, uh -huh. if it, all the all the Jewish schools were like fucking murderers, like they were all like great schools, and they were all we lived in like round uh, like right on the edge of Koreatown, but more towards like. That area in Hancock Park that's predominantly 
uh, Orthodox. Oh, yeah. By the honey baked ham. Yes. Yes. Ironic. Yes. yes <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. By the honey baked ham. And so I got, it came back again and I was like, fuck, I wish I was Jewish again. Yeah. But why can't your kids go to a Jewish um, school? Like, because you got to be Jewish. Are you, do you? Yeah. You think that that's I mean, my, my mom went to, like, my mom was in the same th- Thing, scenario like my mom went to like Saint Margaret's, you know, whatever. Like yeah. she went to like Catholic school. So did my dad. You want to talk about anti-Semitism? Oh, my dad got the shit kicked out of him every day. We had, <laughs> we had one guy. I won't, I won't say his name because I don't. God forbid he's listening. And this brings up trauma. But we had one kid who was Jewish. We played tennis together. I knew him, and then we all went to high school. And I never knew he was Jewish until we went to religion class, and our priest was like. And then the Jews, that's people, they took Jesus and he literally blamed this guy for oh fucking God. killing Jesus to all of us. And all of us were like, why did you do that, man? It's like, it wasn't me. It was the Romans. We're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> and so, but like that, he, he was, there was like, you had, we had one Jewish kid in our, in our high school and it was like, and we didn't, you didn't know what anti-Semitism was. You were just like. But they would point it out. Isn't that fucking insane? That's like I, uh, my family, you know, I'm from New Hampshire. So we would like work for politicians, you know, because they always come to New Hampshire first. And like, you know, my parents would get real involved. Like politicians would like stay in people's homes to yeah. seem like normal. So like, and but so our family worked for um, Jesse Jackson, you know, Rainbow Coalition. Well, and is, then, this, is this pre comments or pro- post comments? Jaime Town? Yeah. Both. Oh, was he? Yeah, 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 like, yeah, yeah. and um, he made that Jaime Town comment, but we still worked for him. Like, we just, I don't know. I mean, like, yeah, there are Jews in New York. It wasn't yeah. as sensitive a time. We were like, yeah, all right, yeah, yeah. you know. And uh, and then my fucking English teacher in seventh grade was like, my family works for Jesse Jackson. Sarah, I'm sure your family doesn't because, you know. And I was like, even as seventh grade, I was just like, if you thought he was anti-Semitic, why would you work for him? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. we still do love him. You yeah. Know? Yeah. The um, the anti-Semitism, you know, it's very funny. Do you know Mark Norman? A little bit. Okay. So Mark yeah. Norman Mark Norman makes jokes about everything. And all, uh, one of the things they you know, Jews, like nonstop. Mm-hmm. It's, it's. It's hard, it's hard when you're doing taking it out of context, but it's it's very lighthearted. He, I'm gay. I call me Chris Rock, and it's just it's almost like uh, stream of conscious, like no filter. So we're in Europe, and our tour manager is German, and Mark says something, you know, Jews, and she goes, Mark, I need you to stop that. <laughs> and he goes, What? And he says, she was like, it's, It makes me uncomfortable, and he was like, It's just a joke. She goes, I know, but it, it's, uh, it, 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 from where I'm from, it, it's, it's not, we don't find that funny. And he goes, well, wait, what do you say? Do you don't like joke with your Jewish friends? You're like, what, you don't make jokes about them being Jewish, your black friends? And she goes, I, I don't know any Jewish people. And he goes, what? She goes, right. Mark, I'm German. That's kind of our thing. And I didn't realize until that moment how severe the actual Holocaust was that there are no Jews in Germany. Right. <laughs> there the, used to be yeah, a that, lot of I, Jews in Germany. I mean, that, that's why, like, like you're not Jewish. No, I'm, I'm the other team. Right. G- yeah. You're German, yeah. right? Kreischer. Yeah. But, I mean, that could, when you hear a German name, it's either a Jew or not a Jew. My first, my first development deal in Hollywood, they were like, I really appreciate you coming in on, you know, Yom Kippur. <laughs> and I was like, not a thing. I was like, traffic was easy. What are you talking about? And they're like, no, I mean, thank you, man. It's you've taken the time. And I was like, I'm not Jewish. And one of the guys in the room, David Tochterman, is like, you're not? I'm like, wait, did I just lose the deal? Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's it's Let crazy. Let me finish. <laughs> the majority of the majority of Jewish people are in Antwerp in Europe. And it's insane when you realize the effects when you you know, I think a lot of people hear a Holocaust and they just go, Yeah, 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 it was a thing. But they don't realize it was a thing that actually transitioned the 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 landscape of the, of Europe. Yeah, well, it happened fast, but it happened slow. Like just like here when you go uh women have 
freedom over their bodies, of course, ever since 1972. And there were 73. And then it's like little by little, like, well, you can't have an abortion clinic unless they have like hallways this wide and blah, blah, blah. Like all these little things that make abortion clinics have to shut down for reasons. Other. And then there's like, well, you can't get an abortion after six weeks. Well, women don't find out they're pregnant until after that usually. And, all, and then there's just states where abortion is illegal. And you just... Bit by bit, it happens. You don't feel like this. And that's why, like, when the Weimar Republic was, you know, in Austria, Germany, whatever, and chipping away at, like, no Jews allowed and Jews can't do this. Jews were still like, I'm not moving. It was my home. I, yeah. I've lived here my whole life. You know, just like where things are getting unsafe for women of birthing age in whole states where, you know, like— there are women who have planned pregnancies that go wrong and have to like just carry a dead or dying fetus and give birth to it in in you know 20 states right now or something. That's it's really fucking dark. It, it's crazy. Like I if I if I didn't have like a a, a wall <laughs> like protecting my like just whole vibe I would be going bananas right now but it's you don't there isn't slow motion or like music telling us this is a major shift in our country where we're going we're becoming Iran you know like if you look at Iran in the 70s like women are in bikinis and it's a total hippie culture and little by little religion took over and now it's led by a guy who says God talks to him and says women have to be covered head to toe and all this shit we're so close to that yeah I mean, where the crazy, you know, um, evangelical right is getting policy passed, you know, and these disingenuous, you know, politicians that don't give a fuck about abortion are making it illegal to get votes and money from interest groups. And they don't care that it's like radically changing people's lives and and hurting people's health and women can't be in as independent as they, you know, it's, it's, there's, I say it in my special, but there's no way it's about caring about life. We know that, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like yeah. it's about keeping women down or hating women. I, I don't know. It doesn't make sense to me. I, you know, we're, we're just the same as you only with, uh, sometimes with vaginas. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> the other day I went out, I will, the other day I woke up and I thought I want a cheeseburger. Do we have cheeseburgers? And then I remembered hell yeah we do we've got omaha steaks we always have omaha steaks listen with father's day right around the corner what do you want to give the man who has everything well father's day experts at omaha steaks have made it easy to put a smile on the big guy's face this summer with hand selected packages head over to omahasteaks.com and use the promo code bert at checkout to get 30 dollars off your qualifying order packages can include fork tender bacon wrapped filet mignon or gourmet grillables like the air chilled boneless chicken breast Burgos, Jumbo Franks, I swear by these Jumbo Franks, and many, many, many more. Don't forget to save room for desserts. Most gift packages come with four delicious caramel apple tartlets. I'm getting hungry just talking about it. Also, check out the other hand select packages that are guaranteed to make Dad's day. Because if there's one thing we know, is that Dad wants steaks. Whether he's your father, father-in-law, or father figure, he's the guy who is always ready to step up when you need him the most this Father's Day, show him the love, the only other gift that's as unforgettable as he is, the mouth-watering perfection of Omaha Steaks. From perfectly aged, oh-so-tender steaks to hand-selected gift packages, Omaha Steaks makes it easy to give Dad what he really wants. Order today and get $30 off the promo code BERT, and every purchase is backed by their unconditional money-back guarantee. Minimal order may be required. See site for details. Where were we the other day? Oh, we wanted to go see a baseball game. And we were like stressed out because we didn't know how to get tickets, where to get tickets. It was the last minute. And I'm I'm like, man, buying tickets for your favorite event shouldn't be this stressful. Game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. With killer deals on last minute tickets and their best prices guaranteed, you can stop stressing over tickets and start getting hyped for the fun you'll have. I'm telling you, I was looking for tickets for the upcoming Taylor Swift uh, concert in uh, in L.A. because everyone went to see Taylor Swift, and I want to go see Taylor Swift. Uh, Aaron Rodgers went to go see Taylor Swift, and uh, 
and I went on game time and I found them best deals you're going to find. I love the flash deals and the last minute tickets, images of the seat views. They give you, they let you know, this is where you're going to sit. And this is what you're going to see that didn't happen at the Super Bowl for me. I'll tell you that right now. Lowest prices guaranteed event cancellation and protection, job loss protection, et cetera. Game time is a place for last minute ticket deals. Tickets are sent directly to your phone. So you never have to dig through your emails. Snag tickets without stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app and create an account and use code BIRDCAST for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code BIRDCAST for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices, guaranteed. I, I don't, you know, it's, and I, sadly, I'm part of the, uh, you know, I, as you said that, I was like, wait, for real? Like when you go like, and then they make these rules where you get the wall hallways, I start going like, like I'm the person that literally goes, doesn't understand what's happening until it's a little too late. It's barely in the news, but it's crazy. Women don't have rights. If you are, if you get pregnant, you are fucked. Like in, in Texas, in a few states, like if you go out of state to get an abortion, cause it's not legal there. You can get prosecuted. The the uh, the abortion doctor can go to jail. The person who drove you there, the Uber driver, can get yes. And right now, um, this this uh, doctor um, who gave a ten year old girl who was raped and got pregnant in Ohio and can't couldn't get an abortion went to another state to get an abortion, and that doctor is now um, get being prosecuted. For that. giving a ten-year-old girl who was raped an is abortion. that in the news? Like, because I, because I, I, part of me goes, I feel like it's I would have probably heard it. not in your news stream. It's the algorithm, news. the algorithm in your phone is not feeding you that information. No, my algorithm is, unless it's a Puerto Rican guy getting his hair cut, I, it's not on my. Yeah, algorithm. I mean, it's so funny because it's just like. So then, so then, tell me what's wrong with me because that's a good. Nothing's wrong no, with you. No, but here, but oh, it, I feel when I hear this, I go, how come I? Is it bad that I'm so, so like singularly polarized about me where I go, oh, I don't want to deal with politics. Like I never talk about politics. Can I go? And then I go, all I literally watch are boat, boat, boat launch mm-hmm. videos, Puerto Rican guys getting their haircut, HBCU cheerleaders. Why are Puerto Rican guys getting it's their fucking, haircut? It's so satisfying. It's, it's just so like satisfying. watching like the edges be perfect and everything. Yeah, like it's well, like if they come in like with really messy hair and then and then they and like a me- messy beard and then they just line them up and like they go, it's just so satisfying. It's so I actually when it, Middle Eastern dudes too. I went into a Middle Eastern barbershop the other day and I watched him clean up a dude and I was like, God damn it, man! I could fucking sit here like a strip club. Um, I, I pimple popper videos, dilated pores, oh. like the things that I'm satisfied I love by that too. and then certain things and i think my dad never let me i don't mean this against him but he never let me be right about whatever my opinion was he'd challenge it on anything so i think i just started giving up having i just started Ugh. giving up and going like whatever i read i'm gonna see the wrong side of it so i won't i'm not gonna was your dad a know-it-all no he is no he's not he my dad's someone who, who his whole motto is eat shit, cash checks, fly under the radar. Don't raise your hand. Don't, don't, don't stick your, don't stand up. Just, just get through tomorrow. Like it's, life's not fair. You'd not, you're not going to do what you love. Just fucking, why are you going to, why are you taking your shirt off? Jesus Christ. Like that's my dad. And so when you, if you said to me, uh, gay, uh, not gay, uh, tr- uh, uh, transgendered talent shows in Florida or something. Yeah, I don't know what that Drag is. Drag shows. It, um, no, it's not Flor- in, it's, in Tennessee. It's, I think it's I almost illegal. Say, Probably I don't, I don't, Florida too, just because yeah. DeSantis's stance is just anti woke, whatever that is. Yeah. So it's not it. It isn't for anything. It's just anti something. I don't even know. <laughs> I don't even know. I honestly thought it was just uh like uh clickbait i was like i don't i don't i really was like hold on are they are they holding are they really bringing drag shows into kindergartens and doing drag shows or like what's going on like i don't know what the fuck it is so i just stay out of it because i go i don't want to get involved because i know whatever my fucking knee-jerk opinion is it's going to be wrong and i'm have to deal with that on the internet so i just dodge it well that's so that's what people see in their feeds they go 
drag queens are sexualizing your children. Yeah. And you go, oh, my God. Oh, my God. You, we've got to protect the children. Of course, that's not what's happening. Like drag shows, you know, drag shows are so adjacent to comedy. Like how many, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's just drag. And and I guess there was something where um, drag queens were reading at libraries to kids. You know how they'll have like someone reading to yeah. a library and they had like, you know, whatever, a drag queen as like Dame Edna or Mother Goose or yeah. whatever the fuck. And that's what they're, you know, and then they're like protesting out front. You know, it's just like, they're not... We had a PE I, coach. I always feel like people, these that. people sexualize drag queens, but they wouldn't dr sexualize like a grandma reading to, these are like women dressed as a grandma or women dressed as a, or, or men dressed as a, a woman or whatever. We had, we had like, a PE coach they're not like, that, um, and he'd dress up as, as a, a PE coach. When we were kids, a PE coach would dress up as a old lady and, and it was hilarious. It was fucking hilarious. And, and I, that, I, I, my mom used to do it. My mom used to dress up as a as an old lady, and and they it was people that had a, a bug for acting that never got to f scratch that itch, and then they, and they ended up in the in the school system, and they're like, let's have fun. Well, like Dolly Parton considers herself drag. You know, she puts on a wig, she puts on all this a face of makeup, yeah. and she has this persona. You know, but it is it's it's totally homophobic and sexualizing homophobia because I mean sexualizing just gay because Uncle Milty wore a dress and yeah. Nipsey Russell wore a dress or you know whatever uh, Martin like, Lawrence wore a dress Martin Lawrence wore a dress uh, and that's all great why because they're straight like that the only yeah. thing that's the difference is that one is straightened and the others are predominantly are gay you know but it's just like you know Todd Glass made the best point you know where it's like when guys, straight guys are like, you know, I don't have a problem with gay guys, but it's just like, just like imagining them like have sex, it's like fucking gross. It's like, yeah, it's gross to imagine your parents having sex or your sister having sex. Do you do that? Or should they not be allowed to exist? Like, don't picture it. You're fucking, you're gross. <laughs> we were in a hotel room one time doing coke at a bachelor party <laughs> and someone put up, uh, someone just as a joke, like just ordered, it was, I think it was my room. And they just bought a gay porn thinking like, ha ha, now you got to pay for a gay porn. And it started. And, uh, and you, you know, when you're on Coke, your inhibitions are a little, little off to the side. And we started watching and no one was talking. And everyone's like, someone's like, oh, you got to turn this off. And I was like, wait, are, is your dick getting hard too? Because <laughs> when you watch a dude suck a dude's dick, all you're seeing is someone suck a dick. And right. the, everyone's in there like, everyone's in there like. And someone goes, no, keep it on. Let's see. Let's let's see when you really have to tap out. And when that dude, so he, I, there's twice I've seen this happen. Uh, the bachelor party was not the first time. But when you think of a dude fucking a dude in the ass, you always, when you're a straight guy, you think it's someone bent over doggy style standing up and the guy's behind him. That's how you think it happens. Right. You don't realize there is a, there is a, there's a laundry list of ways to fuck someone in the ass. And one of the ways is one dude was laying on the guy's stomach and 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 he was jerking him off and he was having sex with him. And all of us were like, all of us were like, wait, you can do it like that? Like right face us. to face. No, 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 no. They were he was it was a smaller Puerto Rican guy. And I remember this so vividly. And he was laying on his on his stomach. His back was on his stomach. Okay. And, his, okay. And he had his arm around him. And then the guy that was oh, fucking yeah. the ass was jerking him off. And right. and we were, we were, we're all like. We're both going like this. If there was no sound, they'd be like, are they yeah. talking about a violinist? Yeah, or? yeah. <laughs> and and we everyone was like, whoa, what the fuck? I didn't know you could do it like that. And that's when someone's like, all right, it goes off now. But like there is uh, homopho homophobia is really interesting because the I was saying this some the other day. I was saying this to Tommy the other day. I didn't have like. A lot of the kids I know that are my daughter's age, that are um, kids I I watch grow up. A lot of them, like a, a, a probably a, a higher percentage than I would have ever imagined, are gay. These are boys and girls that I watch grow up. Some you identified very quickly. And you're like that, right? And then some you were like, oh, really? And then their mom's like, yeah, I know. And you're like, that's I did not see that coming. Well, they definitely all have like the space to experiment too. Well, it's, you know, it, like it was like, and it's. Some one of the dads said, well, you know, it's a cool thing to do now. And I was like, what? Because yeah. I, I was raised thinking, I was raised 
uh, that homosexuality was not a choice. You were born that way. Right. And then they're like, well, now it's more of a choice. Like the kids will experiment. And I was yeah, like, but it, the car, it will suss out and people I, who are I, gay will be gay and people who are straight will be straight. If you could make somebody gay or straight, then gay kids would just be straight. You know, they're surrounded by straight kids yeah. all, you know, in our day, yeah. you know, in our day. We didn't, but I, I didn't, I did not know, like I, it was not, it was not at the buffet when I was a kid. Like right. that was not one of the things, like I said to the dad, that's so funny you say that. When I was a kid, the least cool thing you could do was to blow a dude. You couldn't. Oh like, my god, being gay was like the worst thing. Yeah. Yeah, and it's the worst so it, insult. It's interesting to see this fucking pendulum swing and go. I wonder if it's happening all over the world or if it's just United States. But it's just like, thank God that there is like that kids today. First of all, they kids today. I can't believe I just said, but like they've been through so fucking much. Like we had it so easy, our generation, yeah. like it, there's no war. There was no global pandemic. There was no, nobody came and shot up our school. Oh, you know, you know, it's the, just, you know the, I, I, I'm, I'll make us, I had a, I, I'm, I don't know the right way to say this, but I'll, I'll make a joke about school shooting just very flippantly because it wasn't something real. It's a real fear to kids like I, Can you I imagine having to go to school and be a little kid and and know that like maybe someone's gonna fucking murder you wait can i tell you something that really fucking flipped me out the other day i didn't realize that sandy hook was like four-year-olds yeah like i i, I i'm i'm so tapped out of the news cycle Ugh. that someone said to me not to like not to like not to like at all justify school shootings but i go Man, high school is tough, right? I didn't realize that the majority of these school shootings are babies. And then all of a sudden I'm like, well, I, I definitely can't make a fucking school shooting joke ever again. How the fuck can I, like, I've, like, I, I was, I, all of a sudden it was like, you ever, you, this is what it's like, this is a really bad example, but it's really good if you're from Florida. You enjoy the ocean so much until the one day they show you the helicopter shot of all the sharks in the ocean. And you're like, there's 140 sharks in the ocean. And you're like, why the fuck? I'm, I am not going out there ever again. Have you ever seen that shot? Halston, pull up fucking sharks in 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 uh, uh, New Smyrna or just Florida beaches. Sarah, you will never want to go in the fucking water ever again. I'm afraid of sharks. Uh, aerial shot. Look at that. What? N not just like on any given day. Any I given fucking day. This is in Singer Island. Like they're just, there will be... But they don't fuck with you. Right. They mostly don't, right? They don't fuck with you. They have no interest in, in attacking you. But when you see those shots, you're like, oh, okay, this this is a different perspective. I, but then here's mm -hmm. the deal. D okay. Can you, like, I, my fear is, well, okay, you know the things you can't unsee. Yeah. And then you go, That's okay. why I never wanted to see faces of death when that was going around. I was like, no, I don't want to see that. I've never seen a beheading. Thank God I've never seen a beheading. I was listening to a dude talk about a beheading the other day, and it was very casually on a, on a it must have been on a plane. It was a, a stranger, maybe it was an airport bar. And he was taught, it might have been a clip online. Anyway, I was hearing about someone talking about a beheading the other day, and I was like, I can't believe he's watched a beheading. Yeah. You can't ever unsee that. Wait, so that's, you were about to tell me something because you're like, you know how there's some stuff oh. you can't unsee? So then what, what, okay, like, so then what, what, I don't, I don't want, I don't ever want to politicize my com comedy, but then what happens if you start reading the news and you go, well, I can't not talk about these things. Like, like, uh, like, how does that, how do you, how do you avoid that? How do you avoid that? And you know, it's funny because I like I'm pretty political, but when it comes to my stand up, I'm not. I mean, social politics, sure, like abortion and shit. But like, I don't I not I like dumb. I like being dumb and silly. You but know? you're like, still smarter than the average comic on stage. Right. But my preferences for comedy is dumb and silly. But like, you know, I yeah, yeah. I slip in some like. I don't things. even slip in anything. But that's your gift. I mean, people want to forget. They want to laugh, you know, yeah. like 
so a comic called me in, like a few years ago and was just, you know, like in that, like Trump was president and this and that. And he's like, I feel guilty that I don't do anything political. And like, I feel like I should. And I was just like, why? You know, like if you're inclined to, that's one thing. But like, what a gift to just bring joy to the most amount of people. Like yeah. I'm niche. I'll just always be that way. Niche. I don't know. I like when but, you say niche. It's it like when people fancy. say Porsche. Yeah. I go, I just don't, I don't, yeah, I don't, I just drive Mercedes. The, <laughs> the uh, the, I'm, I feel like, I feel like I was telling, I was, I was, I listened to a, a podcast about Adolf Eichmann. Mm-hmm. Uh, Great guy. Last, last night. You know, can I tell you, can I tell you? <laughs> no. Out of all the Nazis, he's my favorite. Aww. He's the most, he's the most, I, I, so this is where I am really broken okay mm -hmm. so i listen to this podcast about adolf eichmann and i go and i i had a, so many realizations i'll i'll start i'll work backwards without adolf eichmann the holocaust kind of gets ignored because adolf eichmann put a face on the holocaust a lot of the jews and i'm telling you this as right if, during the trials during you the mean? trial like, right during that trial a lot of the jews in israel were saying to the jews from germany why didn't you just uh, get out like what, how bad right. could it have been? And they have a very, uh, I ended up deep diving Adolf Eichmann this morning. Uh, there's a documentary on Netflix if you want to check it out. It's it's, it's all black and white. It's just trial footage. But, Is it um, called Eichmania? <laughs> if you produced it, maybe. <laughs> and so uh, there's a great moment in this trial where I, I'm going to fuck it up, but the, they bring a guy on the stand. I saw a boy. This boy was thrown into the uh, uh, ovens. He got pulled out, and he had the number dot, dot, dot on his arm. I'll never forget that number. How do you know that number? I, it's the number I've ever seen. And the fucking dude sitting, the police officer sitting on the thing, raises his fucking wrist and goes, that was me. And it's, I mean, it's like, it's a powerful, it's really powerful. Adolf Eichmann put a face on the Holocaust for the majority of the world because the only people that really saw it, with really saw the atrocities, were the American soldiers who were liberating the uh, the, the uh, camps. This put a face on it, and so that's that's why he's my favorite Nazi because without Adolf Eichmann, you don't have represent, you may not have representation, right? Meaning it may people may, it might have just said, "Why didn't you escape?" Here's the weird part. Well, the Holocaust is only taught in like 17 of our 50 states. <laughs> For real? Yeah. I uh, didn't grow up learning it in New Hampshire. We did. I don't know where this story was going. But anyway, Adolf Eichmann. I keep, I kept watching it going like, like how he was 35. As oh, he accomplished so much. <laughs> Like hard to think of that now. Like when someone's thirty five, you're like, oh my god, and yeah. he was famous. I look at thirty five year olds and I go, like, there was someone who is who's like thirty five and they're blowing up. And I was like, I was like, I couldn't handle all that. I go, let alone he was a part of the quote unquote final solution. Like that, you, what you said was accurate. Everything you were saying is that it it subtly move out of these neighborhoods, move out of these neighborhoods, and then literally Eichmann, Hitler. Himmler, all they all got together and were like, "Yo, let's just fucking wrap this up. You run the trains, I'll take the oven." Like that, and they had a meeting about it. At thirty five, I, I I was stuck with thirty five. Yeah, I have a hard time doing shit at fifty. At thirty five, how old was Hitler when he died? Oh, too young. <laughs> I don't know. You said the one, one fact in your special little odd Hitler fact, and I was like. I was like, I listened to, there's a great podcast series called The Dictators, and Hitler's got, Hitler's like, Hitler's got a development deal with Spotify. He's like the Beatles of of the, you know, dictators. What, do you think that he was 56 when he died? Interesting. He was a big pill head, right? And like amphetamines or- Yeah, that explains like his mustache. Speed and shit. You ever try to trim your beer on Coke? You're just like going, it's lower on the chin, lower on the cheek. Fuck it. Let's go goatee, let's go goatee. Even, it's even, 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 even. Fuck it. All of a sudden he's here, he's like, how's this look, guys? <laughs> um, no, he, uh, his dad was a beekeeper. These are the facts I know about Hitler. Ooh. His dad was a beekeeper. His dad used to like a, a glass of wine every morning before he went to work. 
Interesting. Hitler uh, only enjoyed a, uh, a a spoonful of sugar inside his wine. He took a spoonful of sugar in his wine. In his wine, yeah. Hitler was a little bit of a pussy. He was really a bad. little bit. A l- <laughs> <laughs> but I love that you had that one fact, little known fact, and I was like, oh wait, am I going to know this? And I was like, oh, I knew that. Oh, you did? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I she killed know. herself. Yeah, she did kill herself. Yeah, she killed herself. Hitler is the one that it goes on repeat on my phone at night when I have when my podcasts because he's got like 13 part series. So it goes Papa Doc, uh, fucking Franz Ferdinand, not Franz Ferdinand, the Spanish dictator. It's not Franz Mussolini. No, no, no. Mussolini's not on there yet. Um, Turkmen Bashi. But then Hitler's like 19 of them. And so I, I know so many fucking things by listening to Hitler on my tour bus just going oh yeah interesting his testicle got bit off by a goat so um all right let's transition we'll get a we should have a bra not that as hot as you think she'd be oh yeah let's take a look at that uh, i've googled her she's a little bit of a fucking six and she's a little bit of a six oh uh. mm. the um, i mean he must have in he must have had some weird sex stuff I, I, you also, know, some people have a theory that he was Jewish. There, well, that is that is. They've also have a theory that he was gay, and I have I push that away because I feel like that is made by people who think that that's a slur, right? And so I go, right. don't put Hitler in the. He was just a dick. Yeah, like if he was non-binary, that's fine. You've probably noticed these uh, strange tall boys of beer in the bottled water section at your local store. Well, it's not beer. It's actually a healthy beverage called uh, Liquid Death. I freaking love Liquid Death. Why are they called Liquid Death? Because these tall boys will brutally murder your thirst and in infinitely recyclable cans are helping to bring death to plastic bottles. Plastic bottles aren't recyclable. They just sent to landfills and then maybe you'll see them in big ocean packs where fish are living under them and then we eat those fish. This is horrible. I don't know anything about about uh, sustainability, but I can tell you those 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 bottles are shit shows liquid death also donates a portion of profits for every can sold to help kill plastic pollution this i don't have the t1 there's just the water i'm telling you it's the delivery system that's why i love this company I, i've been fans of theirs for a long time but i love it because l- the way i drink Now my blood pressure is lower. You can find Liquid Death's healthy beverages on Amazon or in a real tailor near you. And Burtcast listeners get 20% off their first Liquid Death apparel purchase available exclusively at liquiddeath.com slash Burt. Exclusions may apply. That's liquiddeath.com slash Burt. The skincare world is heavily female driven and has long been the wow, wow west for men. Wow, wow west. Whether men can't find the right brand or simply lack the knowledge and understanding of it, skincare is something that requires attention. If not taken care of, you may become material for a comedian on stage where he sees you in those fine lines and the wrinkles in the front row and then lights you up. Don't be that guy. Luckily, men's skincare has never been easier with Caldera Lab, clinically proven to reduce wrinkles, fine lines, and signs of aging. Caldera Lab is the leader in men's skincare and is here to save the day, use our exclusive code BERT at calderalab.com to enjoy 20% off their best products. I use their icon. I used it the other day on Two Bears. You'll hear me talk about it on Two Bears. Caldera Lab is also a sponsor of Two Bears. I absolutely love it. I'm telling you, they create high-performance men's skincare products, and their regiment leads off with their, their product lineup, a twice-a-day routine to transform your skin inside the regimen bundle you're going to find skincare dream team the clean slate the base layer and the good the clean slate starts and ends your day this face wash leaves all types of skin refreshed the base layer is your daily moisturizer that hydrates your skin and absorbs it fast and leaves you with a matte finish so you can start your day with confidence and they even have this eye serum called the Icon. That's the stuff I love. It addresses the three most common skin concerns around the eyes. Fine lines, dark circles, 
and puffiness. My problem is puffiness. I'm telling you, I, I do use, I swear to God, we had it at Two Bears, and I put it on, and I put it on before everyone, and then I put it on before I did. went to the red carpet for my movie, and the lady said, did you use something around your eyes? I said, Caldera Lab. It's made with top-tier ingredients and is a great addition to your daily routine. It takes less than a minute in the morning and in the night, and it's here to reduce your wrinkles, fine lines, and signs of aging. Avoid being the butt of everyone's joke and take a leap to skincare royalty with Caldera Lab. Get 20% off with our code BERT at calderalab.com. That's 20% off at calderalab.com by using the code BERT. Take your health to the next level in skincare with Caldera Lab. Okay, here's my question. We'll get you out of here because I know you, I, I, this is. Uh, I'm getting a, I'm getting my first ever like dermatologist skin check. Have you ever done that? Oh yeah. Yeah. But you don't go out in the sun much. No. You're fine. Yeah. Well, do they look like in your vagina? And... No, no. But they get you naked and they just scope your body. Oh, okay. And then they're like, we got a hot spot here. We got a hot spot here. What if there's something in like your ass cheek and they don't look? Uh, I guess the sun doesn't. No, the sun doesn't hit there much. I don't think you'll have skin cancer in your asshole. Although Bob Marley had it on his toe. That's. Are those things similar in your view? No. Well, yeah, but it just doesn't seem like your toe would get a lot of sun. I guess if you grew up in Jamaica, right? Then it would. You've never had skin ca uh, skin cancer check. I had a little something like scooped off my nose once. I had a friend who just had. I have two friends who just kind of scooped off their nose. Mm -hmm. I grew up in Florida, so like we got your mo my mom would put me out in the sun for my first day of the summer, and I'd burn real bad, and then I'd be good for the summer. Oh, that's that's really interesting. Yeah. Oh, don't ever put ice on a burnt sun. My lip gets so sunburnt to this day that I went surfing with my daughter in Hawaii right before I, I was doing something. And I took my daughter before she went to college to Hawaii. And it was swollen the next morning. Like it was swollen and I couldn't, I was like, it was like this. And she could not stop laughing at me. I couldn't go out in the sun. It was like swollen. <clears throat> but here's okay. Here's what I want to ask. Serious question. Okay. Do you have a plan? Never. Never. I, I really think about it. I never make a plan. I never think about where I want to be in my career in a certain amount of years. I just I just never thought to. I never think of it that way. Really? I don't know why. Did you like when you did you did you when you were like younger, like when you did uh when you did uh there's something about Mary. Yeah. So there was a couple a couple like movies that you were like best friend and you watch the best friend role grow and grow and grow and i was like was that was that planned out was that like a we got to get her in this get her in this and then we need her starring in her own movie no just everything was just i never had like a comedy movie or anything like, really no i just didn't have that trajectory well when i was cut when i was like getting hot or whatever the roles in comedies for women were like and i did a couple of them were like the and, you know, like women comics would get like the angry girlfriend who's like, you have to get a job and <laughs> you have to, you know, grow up, you know. And I was yeah. just like, there's nothing funny about it. Those roles. Yeah. You know. And did, so did, well, even like Bedwetter, the musical, I know that kind of, I know what's his name passed, right? Your friend. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Adam Schlesinger, who I wrote it with. He was in, he was, he was, what band was he in? Um, um, was, Fountains of Wayne. Yeah, yeah, Fountains of Wayne. Um, was that like? Is, is that something that just shows up that you're like you write the book and then they're like someone he's like, hey, we should turn yeah, this into a musical. Would have never occurred to me. And then he came over my house like a couple years after the book came out, and he was like, this is a musical. And he's like going through the chapters. That's a song. That's a the you know whatever. So we started working on it, and then we started working with Josh Harmon, who's the co my co writer, and I co-wrote lyrics with Adam and then he did all the music and then when I, we were about to do it and Adam died of COVID and uh, and uh, this uh, awesome guy David Yazbek came in so we did it off Broadway and now it's hopefully going to Broadway in the winter but um, wait what was the question I'm not in it no, yeah, no, I, yeah no but did, like that that it, it, you seem like you have a very organic career and a, an eclectic yeah. group of friends that are all very creative like i feel like your 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 rolodex of friends are like bizarre 
like really like really really famous people and then really really interesting people yeah <laughs> like i i feel like mine are athletes fighters and then like three bands that i like you, you know what i have like um i have such a affinity for professional wrestlers like i just feel like there are so many great people who are professional wrestlers really? There's like just a couple that have like reached out god and i'm not even gonna remember their name steve names. austin's a badass but there are so many great ones and it's and they're like it's funny because not to talk right wing left wing or you know but it is like their audience is so one kind of way and then their selves is so different you oh know? Like, oh yeah yeah i have a really always good like friend. such loves i have you a know? really good friend who's probably one of the most liberal dudes i know probably one of the most liberal dudes i know who's a really big professional wrestler and his fans are not the most liberal dudes i know but like to me though that's the most beautiful like that's such a beautiful power to be able to go like i have all these fans that's why like howard to me is like has such an opportunity and he takes it, you know, to be so powerful because he's everyone's his fan, like every kind of politics, like far left, far right, fucking lunatics, right all the way to yeah. the center. Like, uh, and so, you know, if I say something, it's like talking into a, you know, an echo chamber, right? You know, but when he says stuff, it can really change minds or at least get people to go like, fuck what why what you know like yeah. curious or you know he gets the pushback he gets a weird pushback because he was so aggressive as a young dude and so like fuck this fuck that and then you watch him age and i'm thinking he's settled into maybe who he is yeah and like therapy and and being in a great relationship and yeah. you know he's the he's the ultimate interviewer oh, amazing he's the ultimate interviewer he's a, he's a guy that i would never do his show just because i would fuck up and sh overshare way too much do you remember when norm did his show and he was like hey you gotta be a retard and then and then he goes or did, wait, what did he say is was that because norm that was maybe my favorite little norm run when he was trying to get out of defending louis and and uh and he was then he went on the view and he was eating tic tacs and he was like what am I gay? Like, it was like he just he kept making it worse. And and you knew Norm. I barely knew Norm, but it's a part of like just barely knowing your Norm. You're like, is this the bit? Like, is this the bit? You never really know. Do you know what he did to me? That was my favorite Norm story. So I had two. So uh, he gets in trouble on that whole thing, and I and I just put a tweet out. I I I'd met him a couple times. I came off stage one time and he just couldn't stop laughing. And he goes, no shirt, no. And he was laugh a genuine, like hysterical laugh. No shirt, no shirt the whole time. No shirt, no, no. And he goes, no, 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 no shirt, no shirt. And then we talked a little bit. We were with Rogan backstage. We talked, we all talked and he told this great story, this fucking. The best storyteller. The best storyteller in a room full of amazing storytellers. Uh, I when he gets in trouble, I send a, t a tweet and say, you know, hey, I'm Team Norm. I'm a ride or die. He's the best. And he writes me a tweet. Bert, this means so much to you, to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm in a bad spot. And to find people that stand by me, it means the world and this and that. You're such a good friend. And then I wrote anything for you, Norm. You know, I love you. And he's like, great. And then I text like, I text like Ari and, Ro and, and Rogan and Segura, like, do, do you see, like, the little thing? The Norm sent this to me. And then the very next text, have I ever met you? <laughs> so then so then I write back, yeah, Norm, I'm the guy with no shirt. And he, and he goes, I'm I'm joking. Uh, and then uh, St. Patty's Day, March 17th, we're supposed to I, – I, my special's coming out, uh, the Hey Big Boy, and I put on a big morning show. It's going to start at 8 in the – 10 in the morning – it's going to run all day long. I'm going to run the whole thing. It's a St. Patty's Day event, and I book everyone. I've got Spade. I've got Norm. I've got Joe. I've got Sebastian. I've got, I mean, everyone, top to bottom. It's filled. The whole lineup's filled. And stay-at-home orders come in on the 13th, and the show's canceled. And I get a text from oh. Norm. I get a text from Norm, St. Patty's Day morning. Hey, are we still on for today? And I write back, it's, uh, I, I write back, it's, I, I think it's going to be canceled. And he goes, I'm at the club. Where are you? 
And I'm like, oh, shit. And so I'm like, I try calling him and he doesn't. He texts. He's like, are you around back? And I'm like, I go, I, I, hey, Norm, it's stay at home orders. Everyone's at home. And he goes, ah, that's why traffic was light. And he goes, I'm just joking. I know it is. He like, but it was just him fucking with me. Was the fucking, he was the fucking greatest. But yeah. Well, I, I love Norm. My I, God. He was the fucking. He's gone too. Jesus Christ. Do you ever look at your body count? How many people you've lost? I started keeping a list and I just, I couldn't keep up with it. It's so many people. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Yeah. And comics. It just feels so whimsical. Like, that's why I feel like comics shouldn't have guns. Like, there's so many times where I go, like, I want to learn how to shoot a gun. I want to have a gun, you know, like in a safe and just, you know, like totally. And, but I know, I, I know I'll blow my brains out on a whimsical moment of feeling low, you know? Yeah. Although it is pretty gangster the way Richard Jenny did it. Why? Well, how did he do it? Like Shot just, himself in the chest. Besides, you can't really say like it's gangster to kill yourself, but it is. It's, it's like it's just fascinating. I guess he went in to his went into his wife and was like, "Oh, you're making coffee. I'll take a coffee." She was like, "Okay," and then he just went into the bathroom. He shot himself in the head. Like it's like it's so weird that you. I'll take a coffee. Yeah. And then be like, eh, I think I'll just die instead. That's what I'm saying. It's whimsical. Like it, it, that's the one thing you should just put off until tomorrow. You know. Have you ever had a friend kill themselves? Yes. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's interesting. It does take the anxiety of death out of out of the mix if you just go, well, I'll just kill myself one day so I know that I'm in control. Right. It does well, take the fucking fear of death. You're like, I'll do it later, but I'll be the one that does it. I think my buddy did it that way. And I was like, interesting. I was with Chappelle and and um I met him when he was he was in high school. He was 17. And he was like the MC and I was the middle. And this guy, Mike Reynolds, was the closer. A million years, obviously. And um, and we he always remembered that. And that, that's, you know, because he remembers it because I said, you know, move to New York. I can, you know, you can, I can get you at the Boston Comedy Club, whatever. And so he always remembers that. And we were talking about it. And I I saw him after um, he showed me he showed a bunch of us sticks and stones. And he was talking about it and he goes, remember that gig? And blah, blah, blah. He goes, whatever happened to Mike Reynolds? And I stayed friends with him for many years. And I was like, oh, he he uh, killed himself at Treasure Island. He got a room at Treasure Island. And oh, God, Colin Quinn sent me his suicide note. And I, I still haven't read it, but it's like, it really looks like 10 typed pages. But anyway, um, that was weird. But uh. I go, yeah, he just killed him. He had just killed himself like a couple months before. And he goes, oh, God. Well, what about the other guy we worked with, uh, Adam Leslie? And I was like, he blew his brains out. <laughs> I felt so bad telling him, but it's just so many. It's yeah. so many. We had a bunch of friends kill themselves in college, like back to back to back. <sighs> like it was, it, and the one guy, everyone was like, I, I tried to make a joke out of this one time and it never worked. First guy killed himself and his dad was military. He was military. Went out to the woods, shot himself with a rifle. And I guess somewhere in the note alluded to the fact that he was, he, he, it, it got to us. We were like, we think he was gay and he didn't want to come out of the oh. closet. Next dude went home for winter break uh, in his car, shot himself in his head. And we were like, well, fuck, I wonder if they were dating. Like, I wonder if that was happening. Third dude killed himself. And the first thing in his note was, I'm not gay. <laughs> He's like, I know you guys are think I'm gay. I'm not. I just hate my dad. <laughs> but, <clears throat> well, I should let you go. It's been a pleasure talking to you. I, oh, my I, God. I could talk to you forever. I could talk to you, for, I could talk to you forever. And um, I'm, I'm, and you're on tour. You're going back out on tour right now? No, I just Oh, you just finished. got done touring. Yeah. So everyone has to go to HBO Max, watch a special. Um, it is, it's so good. You're so good. Mm -hmm. I, I, I use you as a reference to everyone because you're what, like, there's a couple names you just can't deny how funny they are. You, like, none of us can. Like, you know, there are people that can be polarized by certain things, but there, there's a, there's a short list of, there's a list of four, Sarah. And, yeah. And you're on that four. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're on that four. <laughs> yeah. It's an inside joke if you watch this special. Fucking so good. And, uh, and I'm, I'm, you know, I I got a few highlights in my career of like exciting moments I have, but one of my favorite ones ever 
it was during the pandemic you sent me a dm and you said you said i just want you to know i got i just got done talking with david letterman and he he like brought you up a couple times and i was like i was like fuck i i couldn't wait to like track <laughs> you down because i know i would want like you know, I was so nervous to have this. This is the first call we had because we did this thing together. And the first thing he said was like, can I ask you something? What is the, up with this Burt Kreischer? Well, how come he never has a shirt on? But he's so intrigued by you. He thinks you're so funny. And I just thought, oh, I couldn't wait to get off the phone just so I could. Have like- you heard his voicemail? And I've I've played that me- message. I sent it to my dad. My, he did a video one time of talking about me to Mike Binder. And I said, Mike Binder sent it to me. I sent it to my dad. My dad goes, buddy. I think he's talking about you. I go, Daddy, he says my name. He says my name. Like, he definitely says my name. Um, I'm sorry about the loss of your father. I know that Thank it's you. weird. It's weird knowing your stand-up. To, I feel like I know the guy, you know? Like, I f- you feel like you know these people. And when he died, I went, oh, fuck. That was, that was a good guy. It was a pretty great death, though. Really? <laughs> well, yeah, because my, well, he died... 10 days after my stepmother died, which was heartbreaking. She, you know, but when he died, <clears throat> he died of like kidney failure and he he knew he was going to die. And we promised him no more hospital. And we triple check, you know, okay, you're going to die if you don't go to the hospital. He's like, I want to be with Janice. I, I don't want to be in a hospital. And it sucks in the hospital, you yeah. know? And then I talked to his doctor and his doctor's like, it's actually a painless death, dying of kidney failure. It's a painless death. You go really? into a fog and your heart gives out. And I went back into his room and I go, Dad, no more medicine. You're not going to the hospital. And we're all going to be with you forever. You know, like, you know, because he was going to die. Yeah. And we just hung out with them. We took turns sleeping next to him in bed. We sang songs. We died laughing. He was, we were all singing. He, this is his favorite song. The worms crawl in, the worms crawl out, the worms play the knuckle on your snout. We're singing, we're making like dark jokes. Jeff Ross came to visit him a couple days in a row. Oh, wow. He sat down, he was like, Schleppy, I have bad news. I don't think you can be my emergency contact anymore. (laughs) You know, it's like, it was really sweet. Kimmel, Uh Jimmy Kimmel came by for a couple hours and sat with him. We all just like we're with him until until he died. Oh man. I hope I go out that good. Yeah, it, was, it was good. Either that or shark attack. Something happens quick where I feel like I can fight it off and then it just happens. Shark attack. I think about death a lot, Sarah. I mean, they'd have to get your head or your like heart no, first. Half, it, half my body and I'm just like this going. Like I want a moment of bravery before it happens. Oh. Where I'm like, fuck this. Oh, this isn't how I go out. And then and then it just happens, and you go, oh, I guess that was how I went out. So an odd death fantasy. Most people want to do it in their sleep. No, 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 no. I want to see it coming. I want to see it coming. I don't want to just suck, go out like a sucker. Like, then just, you shouldn't be afraid of flying. No. Uh, no. I No. No, because I know. I, <laughs> I don't have control over that. I'm just one of the dudes that was like, shit, they took a wrong turn. And now we're just over the fucking Indian Ocean in the Sea of China. And now we're just, oh, fuck. So it's just, the engine just goes out, huh? Not Do you smoke pot? Mm, yeah, but not as much as, I, I, yeah, but not a lot. Uh, yeah, I, probably little, more than the average person. A little edible might be nice. I don't have your brain, Sarah. Yeah, it's different for everyone. I yeah, guess. I don't have your brain. Hey, for real, congrats on the special. Thank you so much Thank for doing you, this. Thank you, my friend. Thanks for having me. No, anytime, anytime. On the Burt Cast. <laughs> 